Good morning. Uh, I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank. Uh, we're based in uh, Philadelphia. And this morning, uh, we have a terrific program um, featuring our distinguished senior fellow, Clint Watts, his program manager, uh, Rachel Chernowski. And we'll have uh, Aaron Stein, our uh, director of research, our Middle East. Uh, program director and our acting national security program uh, director who's going to be moderating the program this morning. So while our attention uh, this year has been riveted in many directions, uh, finally we're starting to notice that there's an election going on. But uh, foreign adversaries around the world haven't forgotten about that, and they've been paying attention for a long time. And um, so we're going to hear about that this morning. Um, Aaron, who's going to be moderating this morning, as I mentioned, is our uh, director of research. Aaron also moderates our Middle East Brief. He's the creator and moderator of the Middle East Brief, which is our podcast series. If you're not famil familiar with it, I suggest you listen in. It's terrific. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, please check us out on www.fpri.org. Consider becoming a member and a contributor. And don't forget Orbis, our scholarly journal, uh, which is terrific. It comes out quarterly. Um, for our sponsors and contributors, I'd like to thank you also. Without you, we can't bring these kinds of programs. Um, so a little housekeeping. As the program is going on, please, if you have questions, put them in the, I believe, the Q&A. Now we've changed our format somewhere. So put them in the Q&A, and uh, we will get to those. So without further ado, I will turn it over to my colleague, Aaron Stein. Well, thanks, Raleigh, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time here, um, you know, introducing Clint and Rachel. Um, I'll, let, I'll turn it over to them. I uh, just want to reiterate that we are in this new webinar function. So for most of you, this is not your first rodeo with it, but for me, it actually is. Uh, so use the Q&A function. Uh, after Clint and Rachel give their opening remarks, I will collect those questions, and we will do a bit of a moderated discussion. Uh, and with that, uh, Clint, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, for, for your opening remarks. And Rachel, I know you'll jump in if, if, if need be. Uh, and uh, you know, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Aaron and Raleigh, for having me on today. And uh, I, I did, because I was once a consultant, I did bring some PowerPoint slides today, uh, which I'll throw up uh, to use just as an overview for the discussion. And I'll, I'll uh, break them out. Uh, afterwards. So excited to present our project today. We are now at the 14 month mark of this project. We started it uh, in June of 2019. And so our goal was, if you want to understand uh, what foreign influences may be happening, whether it's covert or hacking or even overt, all you have to do actually is read what the countries are saying about the election. And so with that in mind, uh, we built a team uh, in June of last year where a guy named Tony uh, Formica, who's actually a, uh, an army major who was a uh, Downing Scholar, uh, General Wayne Downing Scholar. I had worked for him and he had passed away at the Combating Terrorism Center um, about 15 years ago. Uh, we got basically a free army intern and he helped me set up this project where we looked at the content coming from the big three authoritarian regimes. Uh, Russia, Iran, and China, and how they might try and influence the election by actually going through the data that they provide. And so we began pulling uh, stories from four outlets on January 1st, 2019, if they related to the election. And we've done that all the way up to today. Uh, Tony uh, was alone from the Army and Yale University while he was going to grad school. And since uh, December of last year, uh, thanks to Joe Field, who sponsors me and has helped me stay with this project now for a year, uh, and Democracy Fund, which gave us the resources to not only bring our interns on, but to pay them to do uh, the stories and the coding of the stories and look through the research. But also Rachel Chernaski, who's on this call and is the project manager for the FIE, what we call the Foreign Influence Election 2020 Project, the FIE 2020 Project. And she's been on since December and has been a lifesaver for me uh, in terms of doing this. We did it the first six months 
uh, out of out of hide, uh, <laughs> churning through stories day and night, trying to build up a backlog. And uh, it's turned into a remarkably interesting project uh, for many reasons. Uh, one, uh, it started off as election 2020. And just because of the pandemic has turned into a COVID-19 project as well. There's no way to talk about the election and not talk about COVID-19. Shortly following that, the, the protests surrounding George Floyd have also sparked a, a series of foreign influence. And so we've had multiple layers that are coming through. And today now we're talking about COVID-19 protests, uh, the U.S. Postal Service and mail-in ballots all in the context of foreign influence and the, what each country has to say about it. So it's, it's been a remarkable twist of events over the last year for everybody. But in terms of our project, it's really put us on to some, some new trajectories. And so I'll do a quick overview here um, of what the project sought, sought to look at. So uh, Russia, Iran, and China all have state-sponsored news outlets. If you remember back to the election interference of 2016, which is actually just finally documented by the Senate Intel Committee uh, just an hour or two ago, they released their full report. Uh, a key component of that was the use of state-sponsored news outlets and inauthentic social media accounts, which appeared to look like and talk like Americans. And so we wanted to look at what it was uh, in 2016 and heading into 2017 when I testified to that Senate committee. Uh, People would ask, how did you know what Russia wanted to do? It was like, well, you, you could track all of their social media accounts, their bots, or you could also just read what they say. They're pretty overt about what their opinions are and what they want to see happen. So we set out to do this uh, project. And the way we went about doing it was we went and actually logged the stories each day from four news sites, two from Russia, one from Iran, and one from China. So the two from Russia uh, were Russia Today, commonly known as RT, Sputnik News, uh, which is their wire service and also does a lot of their radio broadcast, Press TV of Iran, which is very similar to Russia Today, also does video but has a website and publishes printed content, and then the Global Times out of China, which is one of their, probably their primary English language uh, print uh, journal that's out there that we could catalog, uh, catalog and codify each day. And so the idea was we'll catalog the stories, we'll see what the relationship is to how they discuss election 2020. We'll then farm those stories out to a team of intern researchers. They go through, do the analysis of each one, they submit it as a report, and we build a database over time. And this is what we've been able to build uh, over the last 13 months have been completed. We're in our 14th month now. Well, we've had 31 different uh, student interns come onto the project, which we train uh, and put stories out to. Um, we have gone through or cataloged or looked at more than 21,000 news stories now. Uh, so this is the miserable job that Rachel and some of the uh, interns have of actually going through foreign content every single day, uh, trying to make sure that we're matching it to, to what they're talking about. And it's given us a really good perspective, which I want Rachel to weigh in on here. Uh, about what is actually uh, the focus of a lot of these countries. What do they want to talk about? Uh, we went through and read and, and did reports on 9,500 of these stories over the last uh, year and a half plus. And we've published now 44 analyses from this data and from the research from the team. So I write a lot of the initial articles and we'll, we'll just show some snapshots of that. Rachel does kind of the current reporting um, but we've also been able to get many of the analysts to write reports based on what they've seen. And that's been a tremendous amount of fun, I think, uh, on Rachel and I's part to watch them get a chance to publish as students. It's great for them uh, when they go back uh, to their universities or they're moving on to jobs. Many of them have graduated uh, this past summer and, and watching this sort of analysis uh, take off. Um, and I think the other thing I would say is in terms of reach, I've briefed this uh, throughout the U.S. government. So I briefed it to Cyber Command, uh, the Department of Homeland Security on two, th two or three different occasions now. Uh, we've briefed this. We got to speak to the uh, National Association of uh, Secretaries of State for the 50 states in terms of election interference in this upcoming November. And uh, we got to be the keynote speaker at their convention in January in preparation for election 2020. Uh, and at different times, we've gotten to showcase it on 
on the news and national media, uh, either through MSNBC and NBC, but also uh, we've provided a lot of snapshots of this analysis to different print outlets, to include New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and Rachel uh, can log many more you know, that we've been able to sort of supply this to. And it comes up uh, pretty much repeatedly. We usually get a call at least once a week uh, wanting to know our perspectives kind of on what these countries are doing, what they're saying about the election. I wanted to just show you a quick snapshot of how this has worked out over the last um, uh, year and a half and, and really in terms of 2019, 2020. We started off with some of the more simple stuff, which is just look at how much uh, candidates are, are discussed. And when you rewind back um, with Russia all the way to the uh, debate stages uh, this time last year, it's been remarkable how consistent they've been in terms of their strategy, which has really been to promote populist candidates uh, against establishment candidates. Um, the one trend that's been remarkable is how they were very positive towards President Trump in general when it came to him uh, in the election context. But whenever it came uh, to President Trump in terms of the head of foreign policy or the commander in chief, they've been decidedly negative, almost an even amount. And that has become more negative over time. So in the last year, they've They've taken a slightly more negative tack, not huge, about a 5% difference. Um, that has come alongside uh, former Vice President Biden, who they've been negative towards throughout, uh, all the way through. And uh, now uh, uh, Biden's running mate, uh, uh, Senator Harris, they've always been pretty consistently negative uh, towards her as well. And so that's starting to play out uh, as we look forward. The other ones that we looked at were Iran. Iran is very consistent, but they also use a very negative approach against all establishment figures in terms of the foreign policy community in the United States. And so while they have far less mentions, they write a lot of stories. And when you get to the end of it, it predominantly focuses on pushing down President Trump. They're highly negative towards him. That was reflected in the ODNI report last week, um, but they're not, overly optimistic about Vice President Biden, former Vice President Biden either. And if they had to pick anyone, it would be uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. They also play to the populist uh, political left in terms of their content, which has been interesting. China is the one that uh, everyone was very curious about going through, but honestly, they write so little and they mentioned so little about the election compared to the other two. They're not particularly focused on the election, um, they write a lot of negative content about President Trump, but that's almost primarily in terms of trade and tech policy. Uh, they are pushing in terms of foreign policy across the board, um, but they're not particularly optimistic about former Vice President Biden. And uh, Rachel just wrote uh, one about uh, Senator Harris in the last week. Rachel, did you want to kind of provide some uh, thoughts on what you picked up on in, in terms of really all three countries, but I know you wrote one. So you specifically mentioned China with the Harris pick for vice president. Yeah. So as it's listed here, you know, they're less candidate specific in their coverage. So it's really more general trends about the U.S. versus China. Um, but recently after Biden announced that Harris would be his running mate, um, they've published a couple of stories that have been particularly negative towards her. Um, centered on some comments that she's made about Chinese policy um, as it relates to Hong Kong and I think Xinjiang. So it's interesting to see them kind of pointedly criticize her as a candidate. So I think this uh, is really suggestive of kind of what we are observing or what we've been thinking about in terms of the analysis uh, overall. And you'll notice there that the, that analysis cut off on 23 March. That's right when the pandemic was kicking in full tilt. And since that time, and Rachel, please weigh in on this as well. It's been interesting to watch the overlap between the three countries as they seek to degrade the United States or criticize the United States really around two to three things. One, all three countries have jumped in and piggybacked off each other, criticizing the United States' COVID-19 response. And that's reflected in how they really talk about President Trump, but also in terms of how they talk about different candidates as well. The second thing is really about big tech and censorship, regardless of the outcome uh, uh, this election season and, and going into 2021. Uh, China is engaging in an all-out uh, information war strategically around foreign policy, 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, and that won't change. Uh, it doesn't matter who wins on election day. Um, the next part that's really fascinating is how Russia and China piggyback maybe on big tech, but don't in terms of the candidate they prefer. Uh, Russia is far more positive towards President Trump and their election coverage, whereas China is far more negative, but both might join together to beat up the United States uh, in terms of uh, big tech censorship, as they would say, whether that's Google, Twitter, Facebook, uh, those things that they want to challenge the United States on. Iran and China uh, actually behave more similarly in terms of their election coverage. They uh, try and shove down the same candidate, President Trump, but they also focus on racial issues in the United States, religious issues in the United States. They're, they're focused on breaking or sort of putting wedges uh, between the rich and the poor, um, talking about meritocracy uh, over democracy, and really trying to discuss human rights in the context of the United States. So it's fascinating to see how they all come together. And that's the one thing they all push against, which is US foreign policy as being imperialist. And that this is their time to sort of work together, I think in the messaging space, to really push against the United States. And so I think what's remarkable having watched this over the last uh, year and a half is, as we've done these country by country analyses, I've seen how this triad of disinformation from authoritarian regimes will come together over time, regardless of the outcome of the election. Uh, and this has signaled to us where we could find uh, disinformation in the social media space. Uh, we could pick out many of the storylines uh, that the U.S. Department of State um, noted in their Global Engagement Center report, which uh, outed a lot of the Russian outlets that are part of the fringe. Um, you could see a lot of overlap with them uh, in the Chinese space. And so while they diff have different foreign policy goals vis-a-vis -vis each other in the United States, um, when it comes to working together to erode democracy and really undermine us, uh, it's pretty remarkable how they can come together uh, over time. The last thing I just wanted to note, and then we'll, we'll open it up, and I'll have Rachel talk a little bit about our, our latest analyses and, and her experience uh, working with the students, is we're looking more now at extending this project. So Democracy Fund uh, came to us during our briefing two weeks ago um, when we talked to them and gave them an update and asked if we would look to continue this um, past election day and all the way to inauguration day. Um, and we are plotting out those scenarios. And so tomorrow I'll join a DHS session, which is planning on doing planning around how do you react to disinformation uh, regarding the election from, a, from foreign adversaries if they're trying to amplify different uh, conspiracies that are out there. So uh, 10 days ago or two weeks roughly, every day is a Tuesday, so I get confused. Uh, how long ago it was, we, we published just some disinformation disasters that you could already see on the horizon and how foreign adversaries could play into that or amplify that over time to create chaos. And so I'll be discussing some of these tomorrow uh, with DHS as they try and plan, how do we reassure uh, Americans about the vote tallies, confidence in the vote? How do we make sure that everyone feels um, confident in the outcome of the election? and also safe in conducting the election uh, over time. And the big things that at least I'm focused on and worried about are really mobilizations to polling places and mobilizations to violence based on allegations of electoral fraud or vote rigging, those sorts of things. And so I'm sure that'll be a big uh, part of the discussion tomorrow uh, when we have it. Last thing is, uh, I'll let Rachel sort of talk. Rachel, if you could, just some of the recent analyses that are coming out um, so what we just did recently and then what you have in the pipeline coming forward. And then if you could just talk a little bit about the students, their experiences and, and sort of what it's been like managing uh, 32 interns who are now uh, succumbed to their parents' basements on Zoom uh, when we're doing this analysis every day. Yeah, so working with the students firstly has been great, um, especially with them, as Clint said, being home with coronavirus. Um, you know, in the beginning of the project, we used to kind of have to push them to do more coding, uh, but now they're, you know, eager to do more work and they seem really engaged in the project as the election nears. Um, so our recent analyses, one thing I wanted to just touch on is this mail-in ballots and Kremlin media analysis. So one of the things that we've seen is the Russian state media outlets have really been pushing the election rigging narratives and uh, narratives about mail-in ballots. So whether that's, you know, repeating statements um, made in, you know, the U.S. media space, 
um, or kind of creating their own conspiracy theories. That seems to be a topic that's gaining traction uh, in the Russian media space, which is particularly notable, um, I think. And then things in the pipeline, we have some more analyses touching uh, more on social media reach of some of these stories. So, you know, which narratives go the furthest, especially with regard to election integrity topics, um, mail-in ballots, that sort of stuff. And then um, different analyses focusing on the different platforms. So depending on which social media platform, which narratives are gonna see the largest spread. Um, Clint, did you want to talk about the Russia versus China interest in the election? Yeah. So um, one of the articles we wrote, I guess it'd be three weeks ago now, um, really focused on the Russia-China comparison. Uh, and you're seeing it discussed a lot uh, in the media space and uh, China's relationship or, or what they want to accomplish in the election. And it really comes down to this. It, in an election to interfere, you have to either change votes or influence the way people vote. And when we look back to 2016 and when we look forward, we have to ask, okay, what is the access a foreign adversary has into the U.S. audience space or into the U.S. ballot boxes? And so on the hacking front, China and Russia, they both have sizable capabilities. But I, th I think at least from the U.S. perspective, uh, National Security Agency and Cyber Command General Nakasone, they have a plan. Um, they they did some mitigation efforts in, in 2018. Uh, I don't know if the news story is well known in the U.S., but they sent text messages throughout uh, Iran and Russia regarding election interference last week uh, for the Rewards for Justice program, offering a reward for anybody that would provide information uh, that could help them disrupt election interference, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and, and so we're, we're dealing with the interference and, and really uh, dealing with the idea that a foreign adversary could change uh, votes through hacking. The influence part is different. When you look at the influence, the key thing is that uh, you have to have a political bridge into the United States and you have to have somebody that you want to win the election. And Russia's strategy has always been the active measure strategy, which is called winning through the force of politics rather than the politics of force by elevating candidates and individuals inside your target audience, the United States, who are sympathetic to Russia and willing to advance uh, Russian positions. And so they're building political bridges. And that's what is so remarkably different to me from, from China. China, they aren't building political bridges, they're building economic bridges. They focus on things like the MBA and market access or uh, big tech, uh, and trade, um, working with multinational corporations. They're building economic bridges. So if they want to influence or interfere, they've got to find a way uh, to either hack and change people's votes, which for them is strategically not particularly useful because they don't have a strong bridge for who they want to be elected. There's no pro-China candidates really that are out there. There are possibly pro-China uh, corporations or corporate leaders uh, that they want to engage and develop. And so their strategy is much more different, it's much more long run, and it's much more holistic around the world. China does do election interference, uh, particularly Taiwan is a great case study. Uh, they do a, a robust amount of election interference in uh, New Zealand and Australia, places in the Pacific Rim. But the key to that is having a Chinese diaspora population that can leverage and help move votes, actually influence how people vote, um, and also in terms of their financial hooks that they can place uh, into a country. So it's just interesting. I think part of the reason China does a message is they don't really have an outcome they want to make sure it comes through. There's no one's going to be voted into office in 2020 that comes out with a really pro-China China, China stance moving forward. But where they can uh, make inroads and influence in the United States is economically and financially. Uh, and that's something we need to be worried about. And you've seen that with the FBI, who's done a lot of arrests recently in the counterintelligence space with defense contractors, uh, different corporations, uh, looking at tech sector, uh, those sorts of things, which I think is excellent. That's a, that's a great job by our government uh, to focus on on those lanes and those efforts. Um, um, Clint, go one ahead, more thing Rachel. I just wanted to add. So um, something we've seen across the board, but particularly with regard to the, the two Russian outlets, um, 
even the, you know, they've started off a little more positive talking about President Trump, but as the coronavirus has kind of taken hold in the United States, that seems to be kind of the turning point where they've gone a little more negative towards him. Um, and so I just think it'll be interesting to see in the coming few months whether there's another shift in their uh, in the way that they cover him or if they'll keep covering him negatively um, with regard to COVID-19 and other other issues that aren't uh, exactly about the election, but obviously relate to it. Um, great, thanks, Rachel. And uh, Aaron, I think uh, that's it for presentation. We wanna open up for questions and I'll stop the uh, share screen as well. Yeah, that's great and really interesting stuff. You know, I've, I've had the, uh, the opportunity to follow along at least in conversations with Clint and, uh, um, um, and you know, off Zoom and certainly off, um, off microphone. And you can really follow along with their findings on FPRI's website. There's a, there's, if you scroll down a little bit, there's a whole box that you can click on the FIE um, um, uh, uh, link and you can get access to the, um, the analysis as it comes along and certainly sign up if you haven't um, for their, uh, their, their, their roundups because you can, you can get, gain a lot of access and insight into their findings. As it comes along, I wanted to turn first to a question from uh, Jim Papado, you know, a longtime FBI supporter. And it's something that, Rachel, you touched on a little bit in your presentation. Uh, and Clint, uh, it pertains to your meeting tomorrow at, at, at DHS, which is, yeah. you know, DHS is, as you said, looking at ways to reassure Americans that the vote is safe from external interference, right? At least perhaps from the, vo the validity of the election. Uh, and studying the actions that it would take to assure citizens that the election will be fair. But how does DHS propose to do this, you know, when, at least from President Trump and from others in the Republican Party in particular, there is constant sort of messaging that the universal mail-in ballots, to be, to be precise, opens, our, opens the election up to fraud, um, or, and this has become a little bit sort of muddled, um, I'm just uh, adding a little bit, uh, I guess, particularly fraud and, and perhaps the, the, the chance of invalidated ballots and leading to multiple different types of outcomes where we don't know who wins the election the night of. Yeah, so it's a disaster, but I, plain and simple. So it's interesting, the, um, there's a guy named Matt Masterson who's under, it's Chris Krebs is head of CISA. Matt Masterson is under him. Uh, there are two great people to watch, by the way, in the social media space, if you watch them, that um, I think are constantly faced with the challenge of what can I say publicly that isn't in contradiction to the White House in terms of what they're communicating, and how do I still reassure people, and how do I do all that when I don't control 50 states and their voting processes? So uh, it's... It's interesting. They can point very specifically to states that are doing a, an amazing job. Colorado is one of them, for example. They can even point to states that uh, in certain districts where they've gone through and done an amazing job of converting to mail-in ballots. Uh, Arizona was one where they had a system where you could actually submit your ballot um, and you got a text message confirmation that your ballots were received and there was like an automated trail and accounting and everything like that. Perfect. And then the post office issue comes up. And so what the problem is, is they're having to uh, not only try and assure against the last election, but now they're looking at really conducting two elections. And so their biggest concern, at least as of two weeks ago, I don't know how it raised out now, was they were a couple hundred thousand short, I think, in terms of poll workers nationwide for election day because of COVID. And so that was part of the push to mail in, I think even from those administering the election was how do we, how do we pull this off if, if we can't even get poll workers there? This leads to what we saw in Georgia, if you remember the Georgia primaries that were super long lines there. And now uh, with the Postal Service, um, uh, <laughs> the Postal Service problem uh, really harms the second you know, angle, in-person mail in. So just last night, I saw they were posting about secure drop ballot boxes where people wouldn't have to uh, show up and vote in person. They could also not rely on the mail and they could drop it in a box. Um, that takes more money, more resources, more time, and we're 80 days out or whatever it is right now. And they're trying to wade through that. They've got mismatched systems across states 
We have certain states that will not uh, adhere to recommendations from the federal government. It's pretty troublesome for them. And then it comes down to really, we know the election is always decided in about 10 states, you know, or 20% of the country. And so what, how do you focus your efforts right there? Do you have the right relationships that are there and then tr try and work yourself out? And they're all stuck at their house. So <laughs> interestingly enough, when I do these calls, most of them are in their backyard. You know, they're not at DHS headquarters. You know, they're trying to, to wade through this. So you've got a tough challenge on board. I will say that there are a number of civil society groups and state election officials that are trying their hardest to pull this off. And um, the challenge is just going to be poll workers and resources in certain states and can they get it done? And I'm not sure they even know uh, what the inadequacies are in every state, at least at this point, because now they're looking at a third or a fourth method for voting in many of these locations. Rachel, anything you want to add there? No, I, I think that covers it. Well, then let me follow up with another question. You know, and it, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, you know, I know a lot of, you know, your project's coding is focused specifically on, it began in the primaries, and now as we, yep. you know, we have the two, you know, you know, the Democratic convention started last night, through, and we, we all know Donald Trump will be the Republican uh, nominee. So now down to the two candidates. Uh, as we make the final sprint towards, you know, either mail-in election day or in-person election day, depending on where we live. During that research, um, did you come across any sort of broad takeaways about differences between the congressional elections coming up um, versus the pre uh, versus the presidential? So, are you seeing the same sort of trends going on there, or is the the efforts to 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 influence or shape narratives from these? These three authoritarian regimes, as you as as, as you rightly put it, um, also translating over into congressional elections. Rachel, you want to take that one since you yeah. you see all the polls, you'll have a better sense of it than I would. Yeah, so it's it's been sort of a building um, from even 2016 narratives uh, through the primaries and then into you know where we are now. So. At first, the main sort of election rigged narrative was, you know, based on 2016 and Bernie Sanders and the Democrats dealing with with Sanders and Hillary Clinton. And in the primaries, um, especially after Iowa and the kind of delays and kind of debacle that happened with Iowa primary, um, that was kind of built on with, okay, there was this problem with this app and this you know, this is evidence of the sort of rigging that's going on with the elections. And now, you know, after coronavirus and the shift towards mail-in voting, that seems to be the new narrative, um, the means by which this this rigging will occur. So mail-in ballots are going to lead to fraud. And as I said before, you know, this coverage is a mix of statements made by U.S. officials um, and and their own kind of conspiracies that they've added in. So it's really been narratives that have built on each other, um, which I think makes it particularly effective. Clint, anything to add? No, I mean, I don't see much in terms of congressional uh, sort of races uh, this time, not much discussion. I think uh, one thing to think about with all these uh, foreign influence efforts is they only have so much capacity to message in any given day. And if you're a foreign nation state, you also are talking about COVID-19, you're talking about protests, you're talking about the election. Uh, there's just so much bandwidth that you can dedicate towards this. And it was interesting at different times in Iran and in Russia, you got the sense that they had people working from home or did not have everybody on staff because they were fighting their own pandemic issues, uh, Iran before uh, Russia and then Russia later. And so you saw kind of a downtick in production to a degree, not huge, but sizable that you could see that they were having their own disruptions as well. Um, so that was an interesting sort of thing to, to look at in there. I don't think there's a strong play in the congressional races, but I don't also understand all the regulatory issues that might be at play around like certain Chinese com companies, for example, uh, by dance, TikTok, right? Like I, who are, who on the congressional side might be worth influencing? I don't know, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure that I would always pick up on it. Well, you know, there's a, there's a theme that I'm, I'm teasing out of here. Um, and I'm, and I'm, is it a chicken or, or, or egg issue here? 
you know, if there was universal mail-in ballots as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, would particularly Russian and, and, and Chinese and Iranian, but I would, I would probably think Russian would be the most effective, disinformation, focus on the fraud issue? Or are they echoing the word, uh, echoing the concerns? I mean, sort of, you know, I, uh, I wonder how genuine those concerns are of, you know, uh, elected officials in terms of the, the, the sanctity of the votes in terms of, of, of fraud from all mail-in ballots, or did it go the other way? Did we start the concerns about mail-in ballots and they are sort of, um, amplifying them. And, and within that, I, I'll, I'll, I'll raise a second question, you know, by, by my old boss and now FPRI uh, uh, board member, Alan Luxembourg, is, you know, to what extent is this playing out over conservative media? You know, you see you know, Trump is, you know, bashing Fox News in, in ways that he hasn't before. Um, and he's gravitated towards OAN News, um, a smaller outlet that, that has an even more conservative bent than Fox. And is there a Russian connection there, Chinese disinformation there, and sort of that amplifying space? You know, he seems to always call on their reporter in his COVID-19 briefings as a way to try and to um, amplify elements of his political messaging. So we are definitely leading the effort this time, Aaron, as you know. So uh, 2016, uh, Russia was creating the narrative. That's why they hacked at the DNC, that's why they hacked at Colin Powell. These people have dumped the secrets out there, driving a narrative into the US audience space. This time, no. There are plenty of narratives for uh, Russia, China, or Iran to grab um, and use at any moment, right? And if you have elected officials saying it, they cannot be called fake news anymore. They can just say, I am only telling you what your elected officials are telling you, you know, and repeating it. Now they do uh, in the fringe sort of alternative news networks, some of them which were outed by the Global Engagement Center last week, create some conspiracies. One of the big ones um, that they used, Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong, the stolen IDs, uh, or excuse me, the fake China driver's license intercepted, you know, across the ocean. That was a narrative that they kind of drove from the Russian fringe. Um, that caught fire in the U.S. space, but it's it's this much. It's just a tiny fraction. For the most part, uh, Russia just sends back conspiracies that are already in the U.S. audience space this time. Um, and one of the areas I'm most concerned about is that they are tagging the QAnon kind of folks in it, uh, trying to build that bridge or a connection. Because why not? It's a it's a set of conspiracies. That's what it was founded upon. Um, which lack evidence, you know, or don't have a strong evidence base. So why not jump into those communities? That's a good way to have a message that is American travel even further is by helping to amplify that. Um, the one thing that I find somewhat interesting or curious is um, China will advance those conspiracies, but they're just no real messenger for China. And so for example, they do something interesting because they don't have a lot of Americans that support their message. They use cartoons. Cartoons are a way to uh, give a messenger that is mainly pal maybe palatable to a yes audience um, that looks like or talks like a cartoon character. And so you don't think of it as Chinese. You think of it as, as like entertainment, uh, which is different. Um, so they're trying to come up with innovative approaches. They also lost a tremendous number of YouTube channels over the last couple months. They made a lot of what we call like boiler room news sites on YouTube, but they get taken down, they're very sloppy. They use like machine or auto translated English. So no Americans are really watching, it's just very low quality. Um, but I'm, I definitely agree, Aaron, like the worst enemy of America in this election go around is other Americans, right? Like we are making it very easy for them to pick and choose the narratives they wanna to advance to erode our own democracy. And there's plenty available, plenty of it available. Yeah, and the other thing that uh, tends to be the case, at least on the state-sponsored media side, is they'll take those narratives and kind of just push them a little bit further. So one thing that I see a lot, particularly with like Sputnik or RT, is they'll take a conspiracy that's going around on social media and then just plug certain accounts into the article that are really like hyping the conspiracy up. And so that is kind of what they show as the conversation around the story. Um, and it just kind of gives us impression that this conspiracy is, 
you know, super popular among the U.S. audience and uh, everyone believes it. You know, one of the things that I'm curious about, because I, I do, I found that, I found that interesting and both like in retrospect obvious that as Iran, China and, um, uh, and Russia dealt with their own coronavirus pandemics is that they also went to telework functions. <laughs> and so that you saw perhaps a, a, a decrease in, um, in their outputs of disinformation. I mean, that's both obvious, but then also kind of revealing in, in terms of that there, there is a human face behind all of this. Um, but one of the things that we saw in 2016, and it came out particularly after the election, is that the Russians tried to use people in the United States for these sort of small conspiratorial events um, to try and generate influence in the elections. And I'm, it's escaping me what they were doing, but you know, you can remind me. Um, this go around, and this you know is is picking up on a question one of the uh, one of the people in the in the audience um, asked: Is there any you know evidence, textual proce procedural or otherwise, that these groups are trying to be active inside the United States rather than just projecting into it, you know, using social media and their own propaganda outlets to, um, you know, I guess maybe amplify our own political narratives? For sure. So uh, Russia is one. Um, One American News is interesting because they have a former, uh, Rachel Craig, me, Sputnik News. Sputnik, he was a yeah. Sputnik News. Yeah, Sputnik News reporter who was a commentator now on uh, One American News. So um, it, he's not working for Russia, but that's the background from which he, he came from. Um, I think the second thing is Russia has news crews and America, Americans that work for Russia today, which are the messengers in the American audience space. Um, and that makes them much more effective. Uh, if you look at uh, Russia Today's commentator list, they're mostly former American, uh, they're Americans who are former cable news hosts on other channels. Uh, Rick Sanchez with CNN, um, uh, Larry King, uh, obviously from CNN, uh, Jesse Ventura was the governor of Minnesota, uh, Oliver Stone did the Putin, uh, I think it's called the Putin interviews right on Showtime. Uh, his son, used to work for RT or has a show on RT or Russia today. So they have Americans who are broadcasting from their channels, which makes it more palatable. You've got someone that looks like and talks like an American because they are an American, but working for a state sponsored news outlet. Uh, Iran has some of it, but not really. In China just doesn't for the most part. China's trying to pursue more of the social media influencer approach and they are buddying up with social media influencers and they're pretty nimble and smart about it. But it's more by like buying them uh, as guests to come over to China to do interviews and those sorts of things. They're, they're trying to do the corporate media sort of route. Um, it'll take a long time to get there. Uh, they're just they're just not in the U.S. audience space. And I think the last thing, and Rachel, add anything else on is when the George Floyd Fro George Floyd protests were going on, there were Russian news crews in Minnesota in Minneapolis almost immediately, like within a day. And we saw that and we were like, who are these Russian dudes and where are they there? I believe they were also in Atlanta. Am I right, Rachel? That we saw them service yeah, so, in Atlanta. Maybe you can provide some more uh, yeah, so it's interesting. Know, details. They, they do hire Americans and some of them are not as well known as, yeah, you're Larry King or, or Jesse Ventura. Um, a lot of them are just Americans who work for RT and, and as Clint said, when the George Floyd protests were occurring, um, you know, a lot of them live in these cities. So they were on the scene immediately and doing like on the ground reporting right away. And then RT can take that and create, you know, different videos, documentaries, um, have their own kind of on the ground coverage of what's going on. And then separately, uh, I think both RT and Sputnik, definitely Sputnik um, reporters both claimed, I believe filed some sort of suit um, for getting injured at the protest. And so they kind of really amplify that um, to amplify the, the chaos narrative. I'd also point to Redfish, um, Clint, if you wanted to talk a little yeah. bit about that and how that can kind of be amplified in the US space. Uh, the Kremlin's uh, media network is just far more savvy. They've been doing it for a long time. And so there's an outlet known as Redfish, which they fund in Berlin, uh, Germany, uh, but it, principally puts out content about 
uh, American political left issues. And they've gotten tremendous traction on Instagram, for example, millions of shares on protest content, Native American issues, um, more political left fringe issues, and it's traveled significantly. And most people don't, I'm convinced almost no one in the US that shares or views that content realizes that's a Russian outlet in Germany producing content about protests in Atlanta or Minneapolis. Um, so those connections aren't readily made. And that's, it's very smart uh, in terms of how they're doing their marketing and how they're getting their message out there. You know, I kind of wanted to zoom out a little bit, you know, because one of the things that I think is both, you know, for those of us who tuned in to the, you know, the Democratic National Convention, it was night one last night, and it was, you know, all virtual, at least all online. And I think one of the things that we've seen, and this is particularly from American interest groups as well, you know, the ability to, to turn sort of like video instantly into a political ad. And so here I'm thinking about the Lincoln mm -hmm. Project. You know, and it's very easy if you kind of like know how this works. If you, have, so you, you, you can rip video, you can put it into an iMac, and you can put it out, and you have a really slick um, campaign video that comes out. The reason why I, I'm, I'm, I'm using that as a preface is because the adversaries could do the same things. You know, the barriers to entry in terms of being able to produce high, col high quality content, either, you know, sort of for what we would consider legitimate political activity is easy, uh, and for illegitimate political activity is also easy. So one of the things that came up in the chat box is beyond sort of like buffering defenses against hacks to, to, ment to, to, to deal with the, the actual physical counting of votes in particular states and counties, of course, um, to signal that there will, there will be costs imposed upon any foreign actor that, that, that does anything more than disinformation, right? How do we educate the public, that when you look at something by this uh, Redfish, which I've never heard of, by the way, but I'm confident if I were to look at Redfish, I would go, oh, that's a bunch of wackos putting out these conspiracy theories, and I would just move on. But other people may be you know, swayed by this because it either confirms their beliefs or they want to believe. <laughs> um, so how do we, you know, is the answer just more education? Is it more awareness? Is it more FIE 2020, FIE 2024? I mean, what are your broader sort of takeaways about what we should do beyond just hardening our election systems? Yeah. So, so I think one thing is the U S as a government. So like there's the government side, right. Doesn't make a strong case for why, uh, what the trouble is with this sort of propaganda disinformation swaying from a foreign foreign influence. And that comes from unity and leadership. You know, you have to have that component of it. The second part is how do we make, people uh, better consumers of information. Um, I, I use a comparison in some of my talks where I ask, why was it when I was a kid and we went to the grocery store, there was a article that says that an alien has landed at Area 51 and no one bought it and no one read it, right? And if you ask your parents, they would say, well, no one reads that, everyone knows it's a you know nonsense journal. But if it happens on Facebook today, everyone reads it, right? There's no... Why do we behave differently when it's sent to us on our phone, on Facebook or Instagram or any of these social media platforms or YouTube, um, but not when it's there as well? We don't have our parents right next to us, right? Or a friend or someone sitting right next to us when we're about to buy this or consume this or someone is not sharing it with us. And so that really comes down to helping people understand the sources of information and how they can get that. Labeling is something the social media companies are increasingly taking on and it's having them a small effect in terms of engagement. People are starting to know they're encountering, you know, foreign content or disinformation. I think the second part is helping people uh, as they come to platforms understand how content engages them. So part of it was uh, who really wants to read an article about aliens that's a thousand words long, but like you might watch a 15 second video about an alien, right? So it's like how the medium engages you changes your perspective. COVID-19 conspiracies are very powerful in this respect, which is people are scared, so the guard is down. Like, can we help people understand when they tend to get duped, uh, what the signals are of that and ways to avoid it? Part of it will be on the social media companies, but ultimately it'll be on the consumer to protect themselves, right? And so I'd argue, argued, you know, many times here at FBRI for the um, nutrition labels for information. Do you know what you're consuming? You know, who's, where's the outlet physically located? 
who's the author of that? Um, where is this content actually hosted at? Um, how do you know uh, this person is who they say are? That's all good. And Facebook actually is moving in that direction. Uh, but there's a speed quotient that is tough to match. You can just make a lot of this content faster than people can figure it out. So it's then, you know, what tricks can we offer uh, the audience? Uh, and it's interesting that I worked with a group at NYU uh, about a year and a half ago. They had like a hackathon collaboration and they were creating widgets where you could go to a website. If you read something, you could click the widget and it would tell you like some feedback about that information source or website. There's some tools there. I think the incentive then has to be pressure on the social media companies. Social media companies, their incentive structure is to get you to look as much content as possible, to click on as many ads as possible, to share as much of your own content as possible without restraint. And there's no downward pressure on that business model, you know, at this point. And there's no way to, uh, I, I've seen some of the breakup stories about uh, social media, big tech. There's no way to engineer um, social media so that it's not delivering things that you want to hear from people that look like you and talk like you. That is how it is built. So the idea that you're going to like structurally create a search engine that uh, is both useful, engaging, and and also fair and balanced for everybody is also not going to happen. I don't think you can regulate your way out of that. It'll ultimately come down to like individual consumers and that somehow we have to bring uh, social connections back together and at a time of pandemic this is not not easy or good Rachel anything to add there um, I, I agree that the the labeling is helpful um, recently we saw I think Twitter started labeling uh, various state-sponsored media outlets so even just having that you know right above whatever content you're reading is helpful um, that seemed reactive, though, and I, I, I am wary of the time because as somebody who follows Turkey, they didn't label any of the Turkish uh, state-funded right. outlets in English. So it seemed like yeah, it was I like I don't think they did Iranian either. So no, it, it was Russian. Which they which they chose. Well, I want to ask the last question. I want to derail it. I mean, so the, I mean, the last question is you know, and it's something I'm trying to bring together as many questions as possible. Is I know you guys have, are coding and really looking at U.S. domestic politics, and I know Clint, you mentioned in your opening remarks that they frame US foreign policy as imperialist, sort of as a like umbrella. Um, is there anything more granular in, 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 uh, that, that, that you left out of, the, out of the, the initial presentation I should have asked you about earlier, you know, about the Middle East or about American policy, uh, foreign policy writ large? Um, and any final remarks that you want to uh, include there? Because we've got about six minutes and uh, one thing I am, in, uh, I, I am uh, insistent upon is, is ending uh, my moderated webinars on time. <laughs> uh, I'll be quick. So in terms of foreign policy, uh, I like talking Russia and China. You know, we could talk Iran, but uh, Russia focuses heavily on Eastern Europe. They're near abroad. Um, and the Balkans is huge for them right now. Turkey is another place that's super important to them in their foreign policy discussions. And the real uh, issue that's not talked about is Latin America. And that's kind of where I'll bridge all three. Russia, Iran, and China are all focusing a tremendous amount of information resources on Latin America. And they're combining at times, um, uh, working together in certain ways. Uh, it's an area that we should be very concerned about. And that's where that imperialism comes across. And then China on the other side, uh, South China Sea, sure but really how they're using an information campaign in support of their Belt and Road Initiative, both on social media covertly and then overtly with buying up news outlets, using their resources, their vast resources. Those are the areas of foreign policy I think we see all the time, but, but probably ignore. Would you add any others in there, Rachel? Um, I would just add that the, the Chinese influence also extends into buying media space and American media outlets. So, yeah, that's the only thing I would add there. Well, I mean, can you give us an optimistic note? I mean, because I mean, for yeah. some of us, we're about 40 days out, right? So I just I just got an email from the uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that says my mail in ballot will be issued somewhere at the end of September or October, you know, and so I should be casting my ballot, which I will drive into the polling to the to the drop off box um, uh, upon receipt. 
for many Americans, we will be voting before election day. You know, so, you know, what are your final thoughts here, you know, as we try to navigate this space um, uh, with all this information that's out here, with all the stuff you're talking about, you know, let's leave on a happy note. So what are you seeing, Clint? I'm forcing you to, to say something yeah. positive. Uh, I'll give you some positive on foreign interference. I'm actually less worried um, than a year ago in the sense that uh, the U.S. government has pushed back on Russia a little bit. There is some signaling to China, right? And so uh, that I'm less concerned about. Um, other positive things is you should go to bed early on election night because we won't know the results. There's no reason to stay up. So you might as well go to bed. You know, this is going to be, I think, uh, you know, positively is like we, we do know these things are going to unfold, right? And there are preparations being made and we can mentally prepare ourselves. It won't be 2016 or 2000, right? Where there's like a shock and everyone's like, oh my gosh, we don't know the outcome of the election. We know right now, we're not going to know the outcome of the election on election night, right? There's going to be counting and the more we prepare ourselves, uh, the better. I would also say the social media companies, as much as I beat up on them in the past and have interacted with them in a patchwork way, are doing better this time around. You know, they're knocking down uh, disinformation over and over and over again, the domestic stuff they still struggle with. And that's really the threat this time around, but they're prepared. Uh, when, when I tried to give them information in 2015, 2016, I was literally told, you don't know what you're talking about. It's all a bunch of nonsense. You know, there's nothing to worry about. And so that's reversed in the last four years. And there are a lot of people working on it. So I'm hoping that brings us a better, uh, an anticlimactic uh, ending, you know, to 2020 election day. I'd also add that uh, just in the US media space, I think you see a lot more coverage uh, for better or for worse of on this topic. And so getting information about disinformation in reputable outlets is always a good thing too. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, Clint and Rachel, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for all of your work on this topic. And uh, I do expect it to continue up until inauguration day uh, for, 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 for participants in this webinar, I really do encourage you to go to foreign policy, or to fpri.org um, and you know, search out the FIE um, uh, uh, page, which you can find at either the bottom of our homepage or under the research tab um, at the top of the page. And if you click on that and you go into you know, the, the actual page, you will see article after article after article going into far more detail than we went to on this on this webinar about the topics that we were talking about um, today. Second, for those who want more um, about this particular topic, this uh, webinar is the first of a, of a series uh, that we are doing at FPRI, which is titled Threats to U.S. National Security um, on Thursday. So in two days, um, we have uh, a, a, a conversation with Daniel Hoffman, a C CIA, uh, uh, CIA veteran now on the outside, um, talking about protection against foreign threats um, and, and, and election security. And next week, um, with somebody Clint and I both know, uh, Rachel, you may know him as well, um, an F a new F uh, FPRI fellow in the National Security Program, um, a journalist um, named Adam Ronsley, who does top-notch work, and I would say the best work on uh, Iranian disinformation. Um, and he will, he will be talking about the anatomy of a spoof, how an, Ara an Iran-aligned actor, uh, how an Iran-aligned disinformation actor targeted actually FPRI uh, and other um, 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 entities, think tanks, politicians around the world. I want to encourage everybody again, I'm just going to repeat to uh, check out our website, fpri.org. And in the far right corner, if you are so inclined, there is a button called support. If you click on that, you want to become a member, a partner, or just donate, uh, every dollar counts. Um, and it really helps us to augment the work that Clint does, that Rachel does, that I do um, uh, on all topics foreign policy. So with that, thank you everybody for joining. It is exactly Thanks 12. For, <laughs> Thanks for joining. Yeah, it's exactly 1230. We are ending on time and everybody have a nice lunch. Thank you. Thanks.